This is Joe Murray interviewing Lil Cohn. Uh, I've known Lil for about, what, 50 years? But uh, I've known her even longer as Lil Zipman, and that's who what we're going to t start talking about, uh, the Zipman family and their place in Ottawa Jewish history. Well, it's, uh, you reminded me, this is Remember Pearl Harbor. I, hopefully, this is going to be a tape that they will remember Lil Zipman. All right, as I've done with the others, I'll d just start you off with the one question. The Zipmans, how come they ended up here in Ottawa? I think the boat that they were on, or the ship, arrived in Halifax, and to the best of my recollection, Ottawa was mentioned, and consequently, this is how they arrived here. It was probably around 1920 when they came from um, Bessarabia, and uh, they left during the pogroms. Uh, do you know where in Bessarabia? No, not specifically. Not specifically. Um, they left during the pogroms with my sister, who was about two years old at the time. Uh, my sister's name is Esther. She's known as Essie today. Uh, from a story my father had told me, they were hiding from the soldiers. They were hiding in, in a pond, from what my dad told me. Some soldiers found them and had said to my father that they wanted the boots he was wearing. And my father said, no, he wasn't going to give it to them. So they threatened him and said, if you don't give us your boots, we cut off your leg. Consequently, I guess he had to provide them with the boots. I don't know too much background about my father's family at all. I know more about my mother's, not specifically who they were, but I had seen photos of them. Uh, I know he had a brother who lived in New York, and that was the only family that I'm aware of that my father had in North America. Uh, beyond that, it's all very, very vague. He did not talk too much about what went on while he was in Russia. They, yes. they ran away with the, uh, uh, from the pogrom, during the pogrom. Okay, so they landed in Canada, in Halifax. In Halifax, originally and then eventually ended up in Ottawa. Uh, what what uh, method of travel? It was probably train. They had to come by train. Then. He never mentioned. Yeah. He never mentioned it. Just that the boat had docked in Halifax and they came to Ottawa. Beyond that, uh, like I say, he didn't reflect too much on what went on prior to his arrival here. He did at one time mention that while he was back in, in Russia, he was also a lamplighter. A what? A lamplighter. You he mean used around to light the street? Yeah, he yeah. used to light the lamps. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How he ever became a candy man, I don't know. So when he came here? When he came here, he worked for the Loeb family. They used to have a factory and a retail outlet. The factory, the candy factory was on Sussex Street. And I believe the retail outlet and offices were on Clarence at the corner of Sussex. And I remember this very distinctly because when I was a little girl, my mother would prepare a sandwich for my father and I would walk over to the factory and go up a steep flight of stairs onto the second floor and give my father his lunch. Mm -hmm. You 
Bought from where? We lived, I believe the address was 156 Clarence Street. Near where? Where would that be? Between near? Dalhousie and Cumberland. Oh, okay. That's, uh, rivers were in The that Rivers area, lived across the road at 155 right. Clarence Street. Mm -hmm. The Gorans lived two doors away. Yeah. There was Sally and and Honey and Doody Gorn. We Doody, used to call sure. him Doody. His yeah. name was David. Yeah. And unfortunately, Doody was in a very tragic accident, swimming accident, yeah. Yeah. out at uh, Britannia. No, Hogs Bank. Britannia. Hogs Bank. They found him in the Rita River. After he may have floated, but from what I can relate, right? it was near the Yacht Club in okay. Britannia. Okay. This, uh, it's worth looking into, Joe, yeah, and, okay. and investigating it. But I, he was with Normie Toronto at the time when this accident happened. I was just a kid, and I know it was on a Sunday, and I didn't understand why well, Mrs. Gorn was... Mrs. Gorn during the high holidays, oh, I, I mentioned her screaming that went on that Sunday when they found out Doody had drowned. But this went on during the high holidays, during Yom Kippur. She would just sob yeah, yeah. horribly, horribly. She it never was got over a terrible it. sound. Um, Mr. Gorn, from what I can recall, remained very quiet. He was very quiet. The girls, Honey and Sally, of course it affected them. But um, it wasn't as evident as, as Mrs. Uh, as how Mrs. Gorin reacted to it, or really never never came out of the tragedy. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, now, uh, who are other neighbors on Clarence Street? Do you remember? Was the, the was the shoemaker still Krasnowski? Was that was on Dalhousie Street. Yeah, well yeah, across the road from my father. Yeah. There was. But that was after my father opened up his own business. No, but he was, was he there then too? Yeah, yeah, yeah Bolton. Yeah. 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 Uh, but going back to before my father opened up, while he was still working at Loeb's, and it was just prior to the war breaking out in 39, must have been a, it must have been a year or so earlier, that um, he decided to open up his own factory at 305 Dalhousie Street, between, again, between Clarence and York Street. There was a barber shop at the corner of York. There was Desjardins Drug Store at the corner. There was Schinder's Clothing at 309 Dalhousie, and my father at 305 Dalhousie. Next to us were Lozone Jewelers. And at the corner was Bazinet. And across the road from Bazinet, no, the corner drugstore on Dalhousie Street on the same side my father was at was Roussel Drugs. Across the road from Bazinet was Desjardins Drugs. Bazinet was like, um, they sold everything, yard goods, uh, small housewares. <coughs> I remember the tapes. They didn't have cash registers. They had like a, a floating tape or a little box that went through, I guess, to their offices upstairs. They, I never knew what the hell that was. Uh, but they sold everything. And we, of course, we got to know the staff. Um, I remember dry goods and shoes there. Um, I guess at one time they may have had nylons, but during the war, nylons were yeah, right. almost a taboo item or non-existent. However, across the road, there was Desjardins Drugstore. don't remember who was immediately next to Desjardins, but I do remember there was a breeze was, and that was like a, a little diner, and I loved their, their hot chocolate. And next to Breeze Buzz were the Shinders. And then there they had a little dry goods store. And 
there was a Silverman. I can't remember his first name. Uh, Maxi Silverman? Ma his father was a watchmaker. Right. I always thought it was jewelry of some kind, but yeah. it was a Silverman. Uh, I, okay. There was also the shoemaker. Uh, from time to time, I still bump into Bolton. Um, and they were nice. Uh, everybody had to, work, uh, had to work hard to, to make a living in those days. And, um, you know, came later. Um, I forget what was at the corner, across the road from my father's store, at the corner of Dalhousie, and you are going towards the market. I remember a hotel where the girls used to hang out and the guys used to go there to pick them up. Um, there was Slover's. And across the road from Slover's was Wieners. However, I'm, I have to go back to Dalhousie Street. Kizzles, yeah, sure, I remember. Um, Kizzles was, I remember Kizzles Hides, uh, which was next door to the Franca Theater. That <laughs> I think it was 10 cents to go into the Franca Theater any day of the week. Maybe it was less. I know I paid a dime. And because I spent so much time at my father's store, even as a little girl, there were frequent moments when you could smell the tanning of the hides <laughs> from Kizzles, and I didn't know where it was coming from at all. But it was very, very evident. It was an awesome oh, smell. Wow. <laughs> Across the road. Okay, going back to my father's area. I, I'd like to reiterate that um, my parents both arrived from Bessarabia with my sister uh, sometime in the 1919, 1920, to the best of my recollection. They both came at the same time. My, si uh, my sister and my parents arrived in Ottawa at the same time. They right. all arrived from Europe at oh. the same time. Okay. Um, I remember Toronto, Toronto Hardware. And next to Toronto was another brother. He had, he had, I used to go in there for sodas. One specifically that I liked was called a David Harem. It belonged to, I forget the, which Toronto it was, the first name, but he had, the daughters were Isabel, Frances, Blackie, who married, no, it wasn't Blackie. Isabel, Frenchie, and there was, there was one Isabel one was the music teacher, okay. yeah, uh, she later married Firestone, yeah. uh, Frances, who later, who is still known to this day as Frenchie, I remember used to make uh, my sodas for me, and I used to go in there for ice cream, and this, this David Harum, and then further down the street were the Mandias, a grocery store. And they were at the corner of maybe Murray and Dalhousie. And coming back towards my father's store, across the road from the Mandias, was my father's competitor, Benny Gelman. And they didn't speak to one another too much, but um, I remember my father would sometimes have me call Gelman as a customer and ask how much the price of his humbugs were and if it was 19 cents a pound my father lowered his price to 18 cents a pound it was an ongoing shtick with them my father opened up his own business I would say just prior to 1939 <coughs> pardon me it might have been 38 the war broke out Sugar became rationed. Um, I remember people used to line up during Christmas and Easter to buy candy, and the lineups were horrendous to the point where there were the policeman on the beat, the cop on the beat, uh, had to keep them in tow, so to speak. 
and they would only get three pounds of candy. And at that time, we, uh, yeah, we sold like the hard candy, the, the, uh, the humbugs. Yeah, what were candies at that time? Do you remember? Anywhere from 15 to 19 cents a pound for the hard <laughs> candy, okay? That is delicious these days. Uh, chocolates, maybe maybe 25 to 29 cents a pound, and they were all hand-dipped by this pretty, pretty lady called Manya Finkelstein, who hand-dipped the chocolates on a marble slab at the back of the factory. They were fabulous. She used to make, boy, I remember her uh, peanut clusters and hand-dipped different flavored creams, and sometimes she would hand-dip jelly that hadn't been sugared as yet, or Turkish Delight. Um, and I used to... You're, when start, she, you're starting to drool just thinking about it. I know, I know. And after she was finished, when she would scrape the chocolate off the slab, marble slab, I, I would... I would go into it because I liked I liked noshing on the hardened chocolate. She was she was great. She was so sweet and I remember her husband, Izzy. I don't know if he ever had a job, but he was a nice, tall, slim man and Manya was a a rather large la large lady, but she, she had a beautiful, beautiful dark face and to the she best of She looked like a gypsy, didn't she? Exactly. Yeah. You're absolutely right. They lived on St. Patrick's yeah, Street. I, I remember her very oh. well. She was, she was a sweetie. And my father's workers were French or Syrian. How old were you when, uh, uh, when w would you work in the store too? Uh, I worked in the store when I was about 13 or 14. Uh, by then I could reach the cash register. Yeah. <laughs> And, um, but I remember the workers, they were so loyal to my father. There was John and Bill Kasuf. They lived around the corner on um, York Street. And there was a very handsome man. I wish I could remember his name. Chapu, Lawrence Chapu, who was wonderful with me. Actually, he was the one who took me out on deviating when I was about 15 to teach me how to drive a car. My father would have fired him if he ever knew <laughs> this. He was very handsome. They were all very loyal workers for my father. There was a cousin of the Kasufs called Philip Kasuf who also worked for my father. And they just loved one another so much and embraced all of us. We were just like one big family. Um, my father hired ladies to work in the factory as well. Um, one was Lucy, one was Teresa. They both eventually worked their way up to the front of the store to, uh, to work for my father. And there was another lady, Mrs. Bednarek, who also worked for my father. And it was it was just great. It was it was hectic during Christmas and Easter. The shtick my father used to put the workers through, and I think they were paid all of about twelve cents an hour at that time. I remember on Thursdays my mother used to take my hand and we'd walk over to a butcher, I think it was Cohen's, either uh, in the market or perhaps even prior to that, were they on St. Patrick Street? And then I was really a little fisher if they were on St. Patrick Street. But what I do recall is a butcher shop in the market. Cohen was on Nelson Street then. Nelson near... Uh, Murray. Nelson near Murray, were they there too? Now that you mention that, there was a, there was another store, Levitons or Levitons? On St. Patrick? On St. Patrick oh, Street, yeah. eh? Uh, yeah. Were they at a corner? Yeah. 
I remember I used to run in there, I guess before my father had the factory for chocolate. I remember living or being told that we lived on St. Patrick on St. Patrick Street above Mossian's where were they a bakery? I think they were Mossian's bakery. We lived upstairs. I couldn't have been more than two years old. I had also been told that I ran down the stairs and I was running across the street and I was hit by a car. And I remember there was a Rita Mossian. Uh, so I must have lived above them or the family at some point in time before we moved to uh, Clarence Street. Yeah, yeah. No, before Clarence Street, we lived at 229 Murray, next door to the Steinmans. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There were, and then we moved to Clarence Street from from 229 Murray. And of course on Murray Street there were the Levines and the Gunners and we went to uh, Murray Street Jewel because it was less than half a block away. Um, it was fun going to Murray Street Jewel. Everybody was observant of one another and seemed and cared for one another and were I hadn't started school uh, on Murray Street. I didn't start school till uh, till Clarence Street, and I used to walk up Clarence Street to King Edward, and consequently have to pass Gershons, who had a store in the back of their house, just just before I hit King Edward, and across the road were the. Uh, Kerchinskis, Meyer, I remember him, and I, he had a group of sisters, and then the Wassermans lived <coughs> a little closer to Cumberland Street, and go up King Edward to York, to York Street, and I'd probably meet up with Lily Fireman, because she initially lived on York Street, and we'd walk to school past the apartments a group of apartments on York Street. Near Nelson. Near Nelson, where Herbina Donnelly lived, and Sam Balin, and there were a brother and sister. His name was Mo or Moses. She had she was very young, but had white whitish hair. I can't remember their last name. At and then crossing over to Nelson were the Bodnuts, uh, and then uh, there were, yeah, Balin, walking further along Clarence Street, uh, and York. just, uh, York Street rather, just crossing, um, just crossing Nelson, <coughs> Nancy Goldsmith and her mom, and her two sisters lived there, and I remember Jeannie Newton also lived there after a while. And further along York Street were the Sasslovs, Eddie and Herbie Sasslov, and their parents, Irving Sloan and his family, Skulski. I think the Skulskis lived in that area as well. Across the road, um, were the Iron Works people. The yeah. yeah, Jack, Hank. They were a nice family. They had a statue out front. A little Schwarzer. A little, a little <laughs> black boy, yeah. yeah. And next to them lived the Steinbergs. Doris? Yeah. Doris Steinberg and her family. And further along, uh, York and Creel was a store called the Edelsons. They were there for quite a while. Next door to them lived uh, the Pollocks. And then across the road from the Edelsons store was infamous York Street School. At 
York Street School, the boys had their entrance, the girls had theirs on chapel, and we, neither the boys nor the girls could go over on, on one another's sides, although during the winter there was a common rink for skating. Some of the people I remember there, not necessarily teachers, I remember Frida Smith. I think she was ahead of me, but most of us caught up to her eventually. She, I'm sure, repeated classes more than once. Uh, I remember very fondly, and unfortunately he died very young, Joel Zagerman. He, he was such a sweet little boy, very pale, but I, I remember what he looked like, and he was very gentle. And then, of course, there was Rose Beckman, Lily Fireman, the, the, the whole Megillah of girls. The teachers, I remember my kindergarten teacher, Miss Erdley. She was very nice. I remember Mr. Westwater was one of the principals, and I think his secretary's name was Miss Eckert. I didn't like her. There was a nice art teacher, Miss Watts. Yeah, she was she was very charming. And the male teachers there was I'm trying to think of the science teacher's name. Mr. Seymour. Mr. Seymour. He was very nice. Sutherland, Mr. Sutherland taught geography history. He was nice. He was nice. Nice, slim, short guy. Mm -hmm. Mr. Mr. Marks. Marks? What did Mr. Marks teach? He was upstairs. Did he teach geography? He taught geography. But upstairs there was Mr. Cook. Okay, I remember the name. I don't remember the person. Well, because there were, oh. there were boys and girls were separate in those days. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Um, Jim, I was good at Jim with Miss Miss Smith. Mitchell. Miss Mitchell, yeah. I was very good at Jim. Used to be good with tumbling and jumping the horse. And I used to play baseball a lot. I wasn't bad in baseball either, and I liked basketball. I uh, I also remember on Saturday mornings going over there with the Saskov twins. Maybe Mervyn, I'm not sure. And racing with them. And I'd always win. Maybe that's how, even though my last name was Zipman, I was always called Zip because I was fast. Um, school was fun. There was no pressures. Nothing of that nature. Uh, by that time, since I finished York Street School, I guess I was about 11, 12 years old, decided to to go to the High School of Commerce. He used to take the streetcar at the corner of Rideau and Cumberland, which took us to Bronson to go to Commerce. A lot of the girls went to Commerce. Yeah. Okay. Going to the High School of Commerce on the streetcar was always the same girls. Rose Landau, who was a mess. Um, Rose Beckman, Nancy Sa Nancy Goldsmith, uh, Lily Fireman, myself. There were a whole group of us who went to uh, to Commerce. Uh, Jeannie Newton, I mentioned her name, I think so. And lunchtime, there were two stores. One was, they were both on Bronson. One was at the corner of Bronson and Carling, and that store was the Shermans. On Wh the other Wh which Sherman? Uh, Louis Jackie Sherman's father. He was there. However, diagonally across the road, even before they came into that area, there were a family called Snyder. Betsy, S mm -hmm. Betsy Snyder, and 
We used to go there for lunches. We could bring our lunch and all we'd have to do was buy a cold drink there. And once once the Shermans came in, we used to frequent their place as well. But it was, it was a fun time. I was very involved in, um, in gymnastics at Commerce and playing baseball. I did not excel in home economics. I hated sewing and I never did any of the projects to the point where I was sent down to the principal's office for a month and I had to carry my sewing kit with me every damn morning. And the um, consequence of that was I got minus 10 out of 100 in sewing. However, because I didn't like my sewing teacher, and she used to preach the fact that if you're ever going to get married, you have to know how to sew. And my remark back at her was, then how come you're not married? Which, of course, did not endear me to her anymore. So, anyhow, to grade 12. And afterwards... side two, and I'd like to backtrack a little bit, um, three things, uh, Hader, uh, Shul Life, uh, Jewish clubs, and so on, uh, briefly, I don't want you to go into chapter and verse, Fine. but let's go and back uh, to Hader. You started laughing when I asked Hader, so go on. With Hader, which was on George Street, um, I, I only remember going for maybe a year and a half, if that long. I liked the, the lady teacher, I think we called her Maura. Uh We used to go upstairs at the Hader. I remember coming down, going out the front door uh, for, I don't think it was a year and a half. I didn't like the classes. I remember there was one teacher called Mr. Slaminski, I didn't like him. So consequently, I didn't go back to Hader. Uh, what I did do when I was a little older is um, <coughs> bring chocolates. Oh, yeah, to, to pay them off, to bribe them. <laughs> Not to bribe them, I did that for the boys. Um, I don't remember the names down. Second, so. Uh, as far as my brother's bar mitzvah, it had to have taken place at uh, Murray Street Shul, but any recollection of that, I really do not have a clear one at all. If I ever tell Mo this, he's going to he's going to feel very very <laughs> hurt. Sure. He has to very hurt. Yeah. Um, I did belong to the neighbor's girls. Were you a brownie or a girl guide? I was a girl guide for a while. I used to carry the flag home, um, and then I quit that, and then I got into. No, I was too young. I didn't get into B'nai B'rith girls or Hadass until much later on in life. I didn't belong to too many clubs, too many Jewish clubs, as I as I recall at that time. I can't we remember, <coughs> for, uh, I'm interrupting, I can't ever remember going to the dances in King Street Show uh, personally, and yet others talk about it like it was a... Uh, so, uh, and, yeah, and also the Tel Aviv Tennis Club. Yeah. I remember going in there once in my life. Yeah. Tel Aviv uh, was quite a club. Uh, I didn't enjoy playing tennis, but I enjoyed socializing with, uh, with different individuals whom I didn't meet elsewhere. Um, I guess I was just starting in my teens at that time. I didn't... Like I say, belong to any specific clubs, but the girls that I hung around with, we started our own club a few years later. <coughs> we called it the Select Teens. There was Lily Fireman, Rose Rudman, Sylvia Weiner, Nancy Goldsmith. Um, maybe Rose Lando. I'm not sure about her. And we had a great time, just call, just being the select teens and socializing with one another constantly. 
The guys were always the same. Oh, shoot, Colleen Wise was in it, too. <coughs> used to hang out a lot at Wise's on Regal Street. Uh, Wise's Delicatessen. Um, the guys were Hi Rudman, Hi Zildberg, uh, Joe Feller, young Joe Feller. Young Joe. Yes. And we used to dance in the aisles there. He had a jukebox, and Barney Wise would sit up front, and we would dance to the jukebox. He was wonderful to us. Um, Mo Subco. Can I elaborate on a statement he made one day? It's your tape. I remember we were all sitting there, and the front door opens, and Mo Subco comes in and gives a holler, I've got the class. <laughs> I don't think any of us knew too much about it at that time, but <laughs> that's what he uttered. Um, Harry Sandler, you remember him? I'm coming to him too. Went to two dances. Um, Pauline Wise lived upstairs. It was actually a saloon. On one side was the delicatessen, mm -hmm. and I think the two people over and above Mrs. Wise serving at the counter and slicing the meat, there was a man there called Ziggy. And there was a lady there. I think they eventually married. I'm not sure if she was a Skalski. Becky. Do you remember uh, Sam Kaufman serving there? I don't remember him serving there. I remember there. him serving no. there. Yeah, he did. Uh -uh. This is before the Del Claire uh, days. I also remember Barney Wise had some kind of a counter outlet at where the old post office used to be on Bezier Street. On Bezer near near the station. Near the station, yeah, just uh, yeah, where the, uh, the railway station was. Anyhow, Pauline Wise lived upstairs. I used to call it Cockroach Haven. Um, and the same group of girls used to congregate there, and we'd have schmooze sessions. And the girls learned to smoke there. I never learned how to smoke. I didn't start smoking until after I was married. Um, and that's where Rose Rose Beckman latched on to Hi Rudman and uh, Nancy to Eddie Saslov, Anita Bernstein to Herbie Saslov. They all paired off when they were very, very young and mm -hmm. and eventually married. I don't see too many of these girls anymore. <coughs> now. My sister got married very young. I think my father had to sign because she wasn't even 18. And that was just a picture. Very lovely. She was a model. She modeled a great deal when she was in uh, when she moved to Montreal and in Toronto. Um, my brother Mo was a zoot suitor. Mo used to wear zoot suits with the long chain and the pointy shoes, and he was a fabulous dancer. My father eventually bought a cottage in Britannia. We used to take the streetcar out to Britannia. We would take the streetcar. I think we picked it up at Remans on Rideau Street. It would take us to uh, Holland Avenue, and we'd have to transfer. And it would the second streetcar would take us directly to Britannia. That was before my father got a car. Um, Whereabouts in Britannia? right opposite the railroad tracks. Next to us, well, out there lived the Nathansons, Lady Nathanson and his family, the Gossowitches, 
Uh, further along were a group of cottages that the Zelikovitzes had, uh, the Fine family, uh, Brooklyn were behind us, and so were Kosowitz. They were all out there at the same time every summer. Um, at that time, Lakeside Gardens had some of the best music in existence and the best orchestras. Um, there was a place called Clancy's uh, that we used to frequent every day, those of us who had cottages out there. The names that are of the cottagers that I mentioned were all in the vicinity that I lived in. Oh, there was also the Blosteens and the Saskas. On the other side of the Tanya, there were the Monsons and Lauren Green and his family. I can't remember any other Jewish families there at the time. But I know the Monsons, were, they were a big family. And my aunt, Mary Clayman, also had a cottage there. Um, the dances, I was too young to go into Lakeside Garden for about another two, three years. So I used to dance outside with the guys, outside Lakeside Gardens until I was old enough to go in there. I became a great, great dancer. There was a group called of dancers who came from Ottawa Beach, and they were considered to be the best dancers in the city. Um, Johnny, Johnny Avon, he was blind. Costi, who still to this day is known as the, one of the best dancers in the city. Costi used to sell newspapers at the corner of Rideau and Sussex Street. And to dance with him was a privilege. I used to go out to um, Ottawa Beach, which was owned by DeFalco. DeFalco did not like the Jews. Um, he made some kind of a comment, and I didn't retaliate verbally. All I did was pour every salt shaker and every sugar container that he had all over his tables. And then I would walk back on the tracks back to our cottage. When the days at Britannia were the happiest I've ever spent, we used to go to the pier, walk down. They had three piers. We used to walk down the piers, spend time there with the Fasco twins, Milton Blowstein, um, Sarah Fine. There was a girl called Willow. There was a guy, beautiful swimmers, Tommy. We used to play tag off the three diving boards swim out to the raft. The swimming was the best. It wouldn't be considered so today, but at that time, there was no such thing as pollution, <laughs> or you had to watch for certain other obstacles in the water. The swimming was the best. And we went there for many, many, many years. I wish to heck my father hadn't sold the damn cottage. Uh, I was a pretty good swimmer out at Britannia, but that's as a result of when I went to York Street School, classes were taken to the Champagne Bath at the corner of York and King Edward for swimming lessons, and that's where I learned how to swim. Uh, as a result, I could really keep up pretty well with, with uh, the guys out at Britannia. Nina Saslov was a beautiful swimmer. I think Zelda, I'm not sure off the top, if Zelda was the best diver or, or if it was Nina. Somehow I think it was Nina who, dove, who was the diver in the family. But we all had a lot of fun. We would have wiener roasts at Sandy Beach. Um, Ralph and Sylvia Saslov were to become an item shortly after that. And up until the time that 
some of us were heading off to do our own thing. We were extremely close. Um, when going back to, uh, to the Fader time, they used to have tea dances at the uh, upstairs there. Is it upstairs or down? Tea, um, tea dances you were talking about. Used to go to the tea dances at the Fader on George Street and on um, on King Edward Avenue in the basement. They were they were held Sundays, and they were great. They had some of the again the best dancers in Ottawa attending them. High Zilberg was a fabulous dancer. Um, the Sasso twins were good dancers. Um, Harry Sandler. He was a good dancer. Um, my brother was unbelievable dancer, very smooth, and very sharp dancer. He was he was just great. Um, you know, I remember coming home from school one day. I must have been about thirteen years old. It was on a Friday, and all the lights were off. It was in the summertime. I said to my parents, why are all the lights off? And they didn't want to tell me. Uh, you know, they said, well, we're going to have the candles on at Shabbos. We don't need the lights on. But what had actually happened is they couldn't afford to pay the light bill. I'll never forget that Friday. Never. It was unbelievable. and still stays with me. However, um, I also remember my mother going with the ladies to a place called the Tulip Room in Freeman's with Mrs. Blostein and Mrs. Saslov and Mrs. Pepper and Mrs. Subco. All these ladies congregated together. And they used to spend time with one another weekends as well. They'd come out to the cottage when we eventually had it. And they were, they were a nice group of, of ladies and their husbands and they stayed friends for many, many years. When we moved into our Charlotte Street home, it was a big house. My brother, every Sunday morning, my brother used to have poker games in the basement. That's how I learned how to play poker. What was on Charlotte? I can't remember. Charlotte Street, across the road from, it was, the number was 92 Charlotte Street. Uh, across from Gossie's? Across from Gossie from the Sandlers, um, <coughs> the Schinders lived there as well. I believe Morris Wright lived in a three-story apartment almost directly across the road from where we lived. Uh, up the street, um, on Heaney Street, my Aunt Mary Clayman and her three daughters, Shirley, Norma and Judy lived there. This was my mother's brother, Izzy Clayman. And uh, actually around the corner on Colbert Street, my mother's other brother, Jack Clayman, lived there. Uh, two kids, Sam and Ann. He was in the fur business, but he also loved to gamble. He went to the track a lot with Benny Gelman. And... Um, I guess they both lost their shirt. That was a sad ending there for you. For Benny. For Benny. Yeah. yeah. Very, very sad. Anyhow. I, I used to sit at the top of the cellar steps. At these poker games were Blazer Wiener, Lade Nathanson, Chuck Skulski, Jack Croach, Kirby Gossowich, my brother, and I didn't know anything about the game, but I learned. I learned how to bet and check and raise. And bluff. And bluff. Yes. Yes. I love the game. I love playing poker. Uh, actually, just two days ago, Chuck Skulski bumped into me. And I also get calls from Louis Sherman, 
who's, who wants me to get a poker game going. I love playing with the guys. There are not too many good female poker players around. Or they don't know how to bet properly. Uh, yeah, they can play the slot machines, which tells them what they've got, but not to sit at a table. I also like playing blackjack. Uh, Jack Croach was a, a great teacher in teaching me how to play poker. We also, we also used to have crap games. The guys would come over and shoot craps Sunday night at the house. And I remember, I won't mention their names, two of the guys were playing with loaded dice and everybody lost a pile of money. Yeah. Uh, anybody who had written checks that night including my husband at the time, uh, were told to call their banks and uh, not to have stop the checks payment. accepted. Yeah, to stop payment. Uh, it was a little disappointing, you know, coming from people whom you've known most of your life. However, life went on. Um, this was... Well, that was later on in my life. I'm leaving out a hell of a lot. During my teens, I, because I was so, so good in shorthand uh, in learning it at uh, Commerce, I wrote a schmutz column for the B'nai B'rith girls. And whatever I could remember about what was going on between different individuals I would I would put in the column it was it was the truth and that evolved into in my later years becoming secretary for Adasa and I would take notes verbatim so that if any conversation I overheard uh, and it didn't matter what they were talking about, whether it was the kind of sex they had the night before, or what they cooked, or what their husbands had said to them, or the gossip, it went into the minutes and read out at the next meeting. Uh, you probably endeared yourself to a lot of people. I really didn't care. But by the same token, Stella Toronto, to this day, says to me, Lil, I wish you could find those notes. They were hysterical. Uh, I'm also now secretary for the Canada Israel Cultural Foundation. I do the exactly thing? the same thing. If I hear one of the, if I happen to overhear somebody whispering, and they are, they have been warned. They have been warned by the president of that organization. They will take down anything she overhears. Be careful. So you have to keep your mouth shut. And I still do. I maintain, you're at a meeting, I don't want to hear gossip. Let's conduct the meeting and get out of here. You want to you want to schmooze around and talk about Jaime Uncle after? That's your cup of tea, not mine. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I remember my brother Mo. Th they didn't have Camp Fortune or Idlewise at the time. He used to go skiing at Rockcliffe. There was a ski jump at Rockcliffe. That's right. And he used to, this is when we lived on Clarence Street and on Rideau Street, he used to walk from there to this jump in Rockcliffe. And he loved skiing there, and that evolved, of course, into uh, uh, Camp Fortune. He spent a lot of time skiing at Camp Fortune. Um, what? <laughs> what do we ask now? What else do you want to ask? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, Lil, uh, we've gone in with the Ziffmans, but you have this dual name, Ziffman, Lil Ziffman or Lil Cohn. So a little bit about the Cohn side. My father-in-law was I.L. Cohn. He had a drugstore at the corner of Rideau and Cumberland Street. Rexel Drugs. No, it was Cone's Pharmacy. And then it was Rexel Drugs at one time. I only know that's it's Cone's Pharmacy. Yeah, well, of and course, I was just it was a Cone's, kid then. yeah. And um, actually, when I used to walk to school with Lily Fireman, and this was going to York Street School, I heard about her cousin being engaged to a George Cohen. And so 
saw if I was still in public school and he was getting engaged. I can't remember how old he was. Anyhow, down the line, I Hodgeberg called me and set me up on a blind date to go to a tennis match with this George Cohen. And because I'd heard about him, I figured, all right, I'll go out with him. He's older, but that's the house. And um, we went out a few times, and then I realized he was the George Cohen who had been engaged two or three times. So I figured, okay, I'm going to see what I can do with this. And eventually ended up marrying him. Uh, How long were you married? 27 years. Okay. Uh, children? Two children. Son and a daughter. Four grandchildren. Um, and if you're like me, the grandchildren are the Marcino cherries on the Sunday. Absolutely. Yeah. I have a tremendous rapport with my grandchildren who are... Uh, well, of course, the youngest one isn't five yet, uh, but with the three older ones, I, I have a tremendous one-on-one -on -one rapport with them. They can come to me with anything, and uh, I'm there for them. I don't, I don't question them, but they know that I'm there if they, yeah. if they. What do they call you, Bobby? Bobby. 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 Baba. Yeah. Not nanny. No, 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 no. Yeah. I'm Bobby Baba. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. yeah. No, I don't like nanny. Yeah. Quite honestly. Um. Following, actually, it was prior to uh, to my separating. It was George who encouraged me to go out and work. He said, "Well, you've got too much on the ball. Why don't you go to work?" And I answered a few ads. I remember going to a car dealership, and I'm going back well over 30 years and they said they weren't looking for someone who was experienced but having a female working in a car dealership was unusual yes at that time then i decided to take some government exams this was in the mid 60s and i did well with them i started with um, the Canadian Government Travel Bureau, and I loved it there. I worked there as a casual employee, and I became very popular and very knowledgeable about my work. And um, there were some people there who uh, didn't like me because I guess I was Jewish, and I was the only, I think, the only Jewish employee there. I didn't care. My boss liked what I did, and they tried to encourage me to become permanent. And um, I wasn't prepared for that yet. I didn't want to be, tied down. be specifically tied down. I had a good arrangement with them for the holidays. Um, they would give me Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and I would work during Christmas holidays. And it was it was a great great setup. And then I decided to leave there, and I took off a boat. I took off a couple of snow. I worked there for a couple of years. Um, actually, I'm still friendly with uh, one of the employees. Um, after a while, I, I took another exam, and I went to work for regional economic expansion, and I had a ball there. I was the only Jewish employee there. I had a great time with my bosses. They, uh, because I guess I was so outspoken and I didn't really care what their opinion was, I just did as I thought I should. I didn't necessarily do according to what they wanted. Um, during coffee break, one of the gentlemen I worked with uh, he closed his office door and played gin rummy. And I remember I lost. I owed him something like five dollars and change. And there was a bank downstairs, and I went downstairs to the bank and got it all in pennies and went into his office and dumped them on his desk. 
so his entire desk was covered in candy. I was also taking golf lessons at the time. And it was around the corner. I'd go there at noon. And there again, during the coffee break, they have long hallways in these government offices. And I practiced golf. And somebody would say, you can't do that. And I said, why? It's my time. I can do what I want. One of the other guys picked up on it. And he also brought his club with him. Uh, I was also asked to arrange the Christmas party. There was one lady who resented my presence there. Actually, my boss warned me. He said, Lil, watch her. She doesn't like you. I didn't care. Um, about April of 1968, yeah, I got a call at that office from High Hotchberg saying, Lil, would you be interested in an interview with the ambassador uh, for the state of Israel? He's ambassador to Canada. And I said, no, I like what I'm doing here. And I spoke to one of my bosses, and he said, you know what, Lil? They're your people. Go for the interview, see what they say, and then come back to us, and we'll discuss it. So I went to meet Ambassador Eschel, Aria Eschel. The embassy at that time was on Powell Avenue. It was a big house. The ambassador's office was on the second floor. Um, I went to him, and he said, would you like to work here? And I said, I want to know what you're offering. And the hours were better. I didn't have to come in at 8.15 in the morning. I could come in at 9 in the morning. Um, pay wasn't that relevant. Uh, it's almost the same as what the government... What about the language uh, factor? Language factor did not come into play at all because they had their own Hebrew secretary. I was going to be the Canadian liaison in the secretary or right. uh, assistant field. I said, what about security clearance? He said, that's already been done. Uh, he said, when can we start? And I said, back off. I, uh, I like what I'm doing. I promised them I would go back and discuss it with them. Went back to work the next morning, and I said to them, I don't have to go to work there till 9 o'clock. And they said, fine, you don't have to come in till 9 o'clock here either. And I said, and I'm tired of signing in. At that time, you had to sign in. Tape number two of the interview I'm doing with Lil, and uh, isn't it wonderful how time flies when you're having fun, Lil? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going down memory lane. We're, yeah, we're, we're both going down memory lane here, and uh, you were going to start, uh, you ended, you were just finished an interview with the ambassador, so you can take take it from there. When oh, I oh, oh. Okay. Ooh la la. Okay. Uh, yeah. We're oh, just yes. we're just commenting on <laughs> the bread that Jesse made. <laughs> Ooh la la. Okay. I went back to the government office the next day. The man who encouraged me Keep to go talking. to go for the interview said, Lil, give it a shot. We'll try it out for six months. If it doesn't work out, come back to us. Consequently, I started working at the Israel Embassy in April or May of 1968. I worked with Ambassador Aria Eschel. I had no clue what I was doing. When I called the gal whom I replaced as to why she had left and asked her some pertinent questions, she wouldn't respond to me. She said, you'll find out the hard way. However, I dug my heels in and I learned how to 
work through everything. Unfortunately, that ambassador passed away here in Ottawa. I, he passed away. He, um, at that time, the embassy didn't have a, a chauffeur or a driver, whichever you want to call it. And he had driven his own car to a function and had passed away. He died in the parking lot of, I think it was called the Town Cinema, just, just past the St. Patrick Street Bridge. Anyhow, I get a call 6 o'clock in the morning. They'll get into the office. The condolence book had to be open. And this was my first exposure as to that procedure. Um, I've worked for eight ambassadors in the years I had worked at the embassy. When I started in 1968 until 1996. It wasn't, it wasn't easy, but I loved it. It was truly a labor of love. Not the money, the money was lousy. But I loved what I was doing. I loved the people I worked with, not all of them. You can't love everyone you work with. I had a great many disputes with some individuals to the point where they wanted to throw me out, but the ambassador wouldn't let them. Um, actually, I had left one ambassador because he, he reneged on a uh, he reneged on a proposal that I had made for time off and when he said no he couldn't acknowledge it I said well I can't work for someone who's not honest with me and I walked out when they called me to come back he was no longer there and that ambassador said when can you come back I had heard through this Jewish grapevine that <clears throat> someone had told them I was very difficult to handle. So my response to that ambassador was, well, I understand I'm too difficult to handle. He said, we'll find out. Consequently, I lasted there for that many years. Now, you were also acting as liaison between the cities because you knew so many people here. Am I correct in saying that? Well, I remember one ambassador, we were, he was putting together a guest list. I don't recall what the occasion might have been, whether it was Independence Day or Hanukkah, whatever it might have been. And he had a prepared guest list. And he said, do you know these people? And I said, yeah, not all of them by any means, because when you're working on 200 names, you can't possibly know everyone. And he said, tell me about them. And I said, okay, do you want my personal or my professional opinion? He said, give me both. And I did, very openly. Um, not, when I, when I referred to personal opinion, it wasn't my own judgment of them or my own exposure on a one-on-one -on -one with them. It was just how they came about being who they were. And in many instances, in many instances, if it weren't for their parents before them, a lot of these people would never, ever have reached the so-called goal, goals they thought they had attained. Um, in many, there were many times when I was the one who was blamed if certain individuals were not on that invitation list. And I remember getting a call from a very good friend of mine, and he said, Lil, you're going to get a call from Mr. Hein Yunkel because he wasn't invited to the last function. And uh, he's going to put in a complaint about you to the ambassador. I said, fine. But if I had control of the invitation list to that extent, there are a lot of people who wouldn't be invited. I have no final say over it. I have nothing to do with the invitation list. People are invited because of their capacities. If Mr. Hein Yankel was on last year's list because he was chairman of a specific group and someone else has it now, that new person is invited. It's very easy to understand this scenario. But I had been blamed for that many times. 
I wish I did have that kind of, of clout. Oh boy, it would have been very small functions. My belief, and I brought this to one of the ambassadors' attention, is invite the old timers who are at Hillel Lodge, who are still around, fortunately, to the embassy. It will be the last time that they will ever have in in a rapport with the state of Israel. They're not going to travel to Israel. This is so meaningful for them. And he went for it. He did go for it. He invited them to the house. He went. Hillel brought them over in buses, and uh, hopefully they're still conducting this procedure to this day. Um, I spent a lot of time accompanying the ambassadors to Hillel, where he had, they addressed the, the people who were there, and they were so thrilled that here was the head of the state of Israel to Canada coming to speak to them. They were thrilled, and to me, that was meaningful. Not some of these other idiots who address the public and want their names in the paper constantly. Um, I met a lot of wonderful people. Now, uh, were you able to, uh, I want to use the word uh, gently, take advantage of, the f uh, of going to Israel because you would get preferential treatment, wouldn't you? Ah. My first trip to Israel, I went because the ambassador where I was working with at the time said, Lil, why don't you go visit Israel and consider moving there? You know so much about the country now and its people. So I said, okay. I went for six weeks. I didn't get... Um, I was met in Israel by former colleagues of mine, former... But um, no red carpet. Not really, not that time, no red carpet. My, my intent was, I'm going to look around. That's why I wanted to go for six weeks. I was met at the, at the airport by a former <coughs> uh, number two who had been working in Ottawa. They took me to their place. Uh, I stayed with them for about four or five days. A former security guard wanted me to stay with him. He lived on a, a moshav, and I went with him and his family. Then he drove me around to different areas before I headed for Tel Aviv, and I stayed with another former security officer and his wife. And in Tel Aviv, I... Uh, I focused around by myself just to, to get a sense of feeling and just touching on areas by myself, realizing if I ever decide to make this move, this is what it's going to be like for me initially with all the contacts I have there. Um, when I was in Tel Aviv on Shabbos, Friday night, and the lights go out so you can't use the elevator. And and yeah, you can switch the lights on when you're going up the stairs if you're in an... I stayed in an apartment building with my friend. But until I learned to do all these things, and I know they're small issues, to me they became important. That I didn't have all the amenities that I was used to, and I didn't know how I could adjust to that lifestyle of living. Um, when I went to my friend in Jerusalem and we were sitting at a dinner table on Shabbos Friday night and he hears he hears the sirens and he's saying no it wasn't the sirens it was an airplane and he said we have to be quiet I want to see if I can hear what kind of plane it is we may have to go down to the basement fortunately it was it was nothing happening then but those six, six weeks I went um, I went to a Seder there, which I've, I've never experienced anywhere. They are conducted so beautifully, and they truly, truly go through the whole Megillah with, with the, the, the head of the family sitting on, on, on a low seat or on pillows. And during the course of the Seder, the phone rings, 
and the host said, we have to stop. One of the soldiers couldn't make his way home. We're going to wait for him to arrive and we'll continue conducting the Seder afterwards, which we did. The Seder didn't end until about 1, 1.30 in the morning, and it was fabulous. However, the little things in Israel that I was used to here, not that they're that much more here, but it was the little things that I realized I couldn't move. My kids were all for my move. Go, it's your life, Mom, you know, do whatever you want. You got there with that or they? I have to cite an instance, a couple of them. I was going out to the Israeli ladies who were leaving the office the same time I was. Now, in order to leave, you have to buzz. I know on the security card that she was. I, ha I forget the comment that one of them made, and I said, you can't do that. And she said, yes, I can. I'm an Israeli. And I said, you're an Israeli, but you're a guest in my country. You cannot do that. A lot of them are still like that, Joe. A lot of them still are. Yeah, but they were very bad at one time, weren't they? Well, I've had fights with a number of them. Right. A number of them. Now, as uh, an active member of the embassy, I'm sure you've run into famous people. I use the word famous with quotation marks. Mm -hmm. and notables, uh, important people, and so on. Uh, again, some of the highlights. Uh, well, because so many prime ministers over all the years that I was actually at the embassy, um, Menachem Begin and his wife, Golda Meir, fabulous, fabulous lady. Um, Shamir, yeah, he was great too. Paris, I loved Shimon Paris. I remember the first time I met him, I went through the receiving line twice just to be able to shake his hands and look at him again. Rabin, um, Herzog, Prime Minister Herzog, that wasn't too many years back. And um, Moshe Dayan, there was a function going on for him in Montreal, and only one of the secretaries, like there's at each consulate in Montreal and Toronto and myself in Ottawa um, was permitted to go and, and I was the one who was who was selected to go to this function. He, uh, he was a very weak speaker, you know, considering the profile that he projected, generally uh, his, his speaking abilities um, was a lot to be desired. But over the years, I don't think I could have met any of these people, you know, had I continued working in the government or of elsewhere. Of course, of course. Nowhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Abba Eben, I remember there was a reception for him. Uh, I believe it was at the Chateau Laurier. He was a polished uh, person, wasn't he, from the UN and so on? Oh, uh, he was. I, well, like I say, I didn't spend too much time. I was just checking no, but I'm, I'm the table. No, but I'm just going like what I've seen. Oh, yeah, Abbey, yeah. You know? He was very eloquent. Yeah. Very much so. Uh, who else did I meet? Uh, what's the name of the previous prime minister? Well, wasn't Netanyahu. Ah, uh, yeah, Bibi Netanyahu. He was here at uh, I met him very briefly at the embassy. So yeah, you know, off off the top, there were a lot of individuals uh, who I really, really felt privileged to have to have met. Some of the some of my ambassadors. Uh, are still in touch with me as currently as last week. Uh, the last ambassador whom I worked with, uh, Itzhak Shelef, called me from Beijing. Huh. Um, I had a tremendous rapport with both he and his entire family. I'm talking about his wife, his sons, his daughters, because when he was appointed ambassador here, um, I had worked with him before in the middle 80s when he was n number two here. So I got to know the whole mishpucha very well. And we remained friends in, in the years that he had returned to Israel. I still hear from former press officers, former counselors as recent, constantly, 
it's it's almost yearly that I hear from them during Pesach, during the high holidays. Yeah, yeah. They're still in touch, uh, which, which is which is nice because I know I wasn't always uh, always great to now, work with. Were you I an Israeli gourmet? Did you enjoy eating Israeli foods? And Not so all on? of it. No. Not no. all of it. No. Uh, like what? Like um, falafel. Okay, that's uh, falafel hummus. Hummus I like. Falafel I can live without. Yeah. Uh, I guess what else? Is that they wrap in the leaves. I don't know. If it's oh yeah, dolmas. I don't know, but I don't like it. Oh yeah, the grape leaves. Oh, exactly. I, I make like a it. beautiful one. Okay, yeah. you eat it. You eat it. <laughs> Um, when, when I worked, I was so open with the ambassadors, I was so upfront. I remember working with one in particular, and I wasn't getting any kind of feedback from him. And I remember walking into his office maybe 11 months after I had worked with him, slammed the door, and I said, listen, we have to talk. He said, what? I said, I've been with you almost a year. I have to know what the hell's going on. I'm not getting any feedback from you. I don't know what you think of me. I spend more time with you and working here than I do at home or elsewhere. I'm on call constantly. I have to know what you think. He says, well, you speak Yiddish, yeah. And in Yiddish, she says, well, take a hammer and hit yourself on the head. He says, have you ever heard me complain? I said, no. He says, so? Now, this man was and is a perfectionist. He's a beautiful artist and a total perfectionist about everything. He, would dict he, he wrote beautiful speeches. He would dictate them to me. He would come up with a word, and I have good command of the English language. And I'd look up at him and say, what now? And I'd say, if I don't understand that word, your audience won't. And he'd take a Hebrew dictionary and I'd get the uh, thesaurus and we'd, we'd debate. But this was after my initial conversation with him. We became the best of friends. To the point where one of my last conversations with him, when I spoke to both he and his wife, he said, Lil, you have to remember something. I'm the ambassador that loves you the best. It's unbelievable. Um, I did go back to Israel again, and that's when I got the red carpet treatment, where they provided the driver, where I was met at, we were met at the airport, where we didn't have to go through customs, where every single thing was looked after, the hotels, everything. It was amazing, amazing the way they treated me. I took my brother-in-law with me. He wanted to go, and it was a phenomenal visit. Mm. I'll never forget what they did. What else? Good memories. Uh, Unbelievable. You know, Unbelievable. Not many people can retire and look back uh, with enthusiasm and just listening to you, uh, you enjoyed uh, what you were doing. I enjoyed. It wasn't just the job. I enjoyed the, the challenge. I enjoyed what I was helping them do. Yeah, yeah. And um, you know, to this day, even the current ambassador, whom I just met briefly because he was working in Toronto at one of the years that I was there, but we had a nice rapport. And, you know, he too has said, Lil, you have no idea how much they talk about you back home. Even though I might have been a hilaria, yeah. but I was very upfront yes, and very yes, honest. Yes. And if I had to say something, I said it. Are you still on, uh, quotation marks, on call? If they need something, they no. can call you? No, they won't call me. No, no. no. They, have, they have a good staff there now. No, but I'm just thinking if something comes up, uh, they need an extra body at a function and so on, you were never called for things like that? No, that, would, I, I, that, 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 no, that wouldn't occur. No. Not no, at all. No, no, no. Um, no. I knew that with my last ambassador, the one that I had worked with in the 80s, um, the ambassador I had the one-on-one -on -one confrontation with, would, when his term was over, would, would come up and say, well, they, they, this such and such name has come up, and I said, hell, if he's, in, if he's appointed, I'm leaving. And um, because I knew a lot of these people yes. and their backgrounds, yes. and some of them I really didn't like yes. and couldn't see myself working for them.
But when they came up with Itzhak Shelot's name, I said, for him I'll stay. And when he arrived, I said to him, Itzhak, I'm going to work with you through your term here. You leave on a Wednesday, I'm out of here Thursday. And that's the way it was. Okay, now that you've retired, how long have you been out? Four out, years. Out, out of the trenches. <laughs> Four years. Four years? Yeah. Uh, okay, what have you been doing in these four years uh, besides uh, not driving a car anymore? <laughs> I never had to drive a car. Well, I gave up my car because I always I always situated myself so close to the embassy, and consequently I, I used my car maybe twice a month. I gave it to my daughter. I haven't really focused on anything yet. What, I, uh, what do you do for, a, for not a hobby or for... You, you can't, you're not going to sit in the house all day. So what do you do? I, I love to walk. I'm a walker. Yes. I love to walk. Um, I haven't gotten involved with too many organizations. As I mentioned earlier, I'm secretary with the Canada-Israel Cultural Foundation. And what is that? Canada-Israel Cultural Foundation um, is an organization that, that provides funds in bringing about talents. Is that the thing that the Verids are involved in? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I, so, no, I, I know they that... Promote, they promote talented individuals and uh, provide funding for them. It's, it's a good organization. And then I'm also secretary at the apartment building I live in. Um, I take notes there, too. Uh, I'm an executive there. Beyond that, I haven't really wanted to get involved in, um, in anything else, although I am thinking of volunteer work with um, teenagers. I'd like to work. I'd like to be a big sister. Beyond that, I really can't focus on anything else. Okay, uh, you left on a high with the ambassador. How about leaving on a high with this recording? So you realize this is going to be available uh, for anyone that goes through the archives. But more importantly, now, if there at any time you do start thinking, uh, I should have said this or I could have said that, any time you want to add to this tape, Will, just yeah. give me a call and we'll arrange uh, so that you can add to it. Well, there's a lot of things I'd like to add, but don't let me. That's right, because uh, this is a kosher home. This is a respectable home, and you're not going to... Uh, I'm not going to malign anyone. I'm just going to voice my own personal opinion. Has no, no, no. That's you. why I said this is a kosher home, and I will not get you uh, calling this person a pig and this one, a damn pig, and I'm far, more, I'm far more eloquent than that. 